Hey, Will, we are back with another episode of Measuring Agility. We are going to continue to expand our topics uh, in the KVA realm, specifically time to market. Today, we're talking about cycle time. By the way, if you have not liked or subscribed, please do so now. We've got more of these coming. Will and I have like a million videos planned. Is that right? Maybe one million? Yeah, it's it's by the time we've covered every single metric we could possibly put into EVM. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll find another one. And then we have a whole series on goals we could do. <laughs> cool. All uh, right. What all are right. we talking about today, Todd? Cycle time. I'm going to show our board if everybody remembers this from the last time. If not, go back and check out our introduction when we started talking about time to market. Uh, we did a video on aging, right? So we did a video on aging. Today's topic is cycle time. So again, time to market, right? One of the KVA's key value areas of uh, evidence-based management. We're just talking about some things that you might be able to measure under here. Don't limit your thinking to what we have to say, but here's some things that we really like. Uh, so we talked about aging, Will, cycle time. Yeah, yeah. So so cycle time, if you're already measuring aging, um, you are just one step away from knowing your cycle times. Um, and that is a work item age becomes a cycle time the moment you finish that piece of work, right? So we have a start date, we have an end date, and the amount of days it took to deliver it, that is your cycle time. Yeah, and you know, Will, I am going to immediately throw something down into the how here because we have the why, how, and some examples. The how, in order to measure cycle time, something that you really need to have is a starting point for which you're going to begin that clock and an ending point. And something that I'm going to say right out of the gate about a starting point and an ending point is uh, in some instances, your ending point isn't it's at the customer. It's with the customer. Let's be really conscious of that because cycle time can be an illusion if people don't have an understanding of when that timer starts and when that timer ends. Right. Absolutely. So make sure you have a starting and an ending point and make sure that you are making that the both the start and the end point well known. Right. Make some transparency around what you mean by your starting point and ending point. Yeah. At least your at least the team you're doing this with should all agree on what the ending point is and what the starting point is. Um, ideally, your stakeholders, um, which includes your customer, of course, uh, are are at least aware of what you consider to be done. Um, because otherwise you're going to have statistics on something that people don't necessarily agree with, which mm -hmm. could bite you later on. Yeah. And, and you know, just to, to, to maybe give an example of that, right. Let's give an example of that. Let's, let's suppose you're working with a, with a software development team, right. And uh, the, t they say that when they start coding when a feature is the starting point and mm -hmm. when it is in a testing environment is the ending point, right. Well, there is more work left to be done to get it from testing into the customer's hands, right? But this team's definition of their starting and ending points is from the time we start coding it until the time it's in the testing environment. There is a gap of undone work there. Your stakeholders may not understand that. They may see and understand when you say you're done with something. This is kind of kind of a little bit of definition of dunny type stuff here. Yeah. But how many times I've seen people paint the illusion that they're done with something, call it done and measure it as done when it's not in the customer's hands. Ultimately, ultimately, if I ruled the universe, an end point when it comes to done would be that the customer has it. Or even a step further that we've validated it uh, and the customer is using it or not, we have some data in production. But that's yeah. not always possible. Well, and, and there's there's multiple levels of detail you can go into. You can make this more complex if if you want to, if you want more more granular data, right? So you might say, hey, we're going to define multiple ending points in this journey. One is, you know, it's done. Uh, it's done on our servers. We've released it uh, to the public. Um, we might say we have an additional ending point that we're looking at when our customer has first used this feature. Um, and then we might have a third one that says, okay, this is when we've actually gotten feedback from that user on that feature, right? And that would allow you to kind of start looking at, well, how long, um, 
you know, we can get stuff to the market really quickly, but how quickly do we actually know if it was the right thing? What's our customer adoption rates look like? But again, don't do this until you've at least got your basics in order, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and why do we say this? Todd, what, why do we want to know cycle time? What does this enable us to do? Yeah, so this is the foundation of everything, right? So I'm going to say this is this is a foundational metric because based off of cycle time, um, so cycle time in and of itself, we can arrive at a single item forecast. And we say that probabilistic thinking, we can use something like a Monte Carlo simulation to come up with, we're going to talk about this later, if we could just keep pushing this down the road, a service level expectation which is a probability from the time we start something until the time that we end it. So let's say still will, right? We love probabilistically when we start it, 85% of the time we're finished with it in four days, right? 85% yeah. of the time in four days, around four days. We'd mm -hmm. like to use that language because there's always 15% of the time that it's not going to happen. So yeah. it allows us to have a single item forecast. And that's just a beginning conversation because it allows much more. So I'm going to start with that. Um, it, it gives us the ability to have a single item forecast. It's This is one of those things where once you have some information on your cycle times, suddenly you get a lot of a lot more use out of measuring your work item age mm -hmm. as well. Um, I actually had a conversation earlier this week with a line manager at a customer service department, internal customer service, right? So th th these were employee requests they were handling. We had an initial data set that we were looking at of give or take about 4,000 items delivered in the past five months, right? Lots of different employee requests. And so we found that, hey, you know, your 50% line is at is at three days, your 70% line is at five days, your 85% line is at 10 days, right? So what does this, uh, did this allow them to do? Um, well, basically it led to, well, once something's older than three days, this is when you want to start having a conversation with your team. Up until this point, you know, just leave it to them. They can manage everything. Once it's older than 50%, half of all your stuff was already done at this point. Once you've crossed that five-day boundary, 70% of your stuff historically was already done at this point. Right? So the chance of it being done that week, right, or within the next two weeks, starts going down really rapidly. So it enhances your aging conversation and it allows you to much earlier detect things that you might want to escalate or unblock or at least do some expectation management on. Yeah. And I'm putting that uh, right next to this card that I was creating. So uh, the ability to have a single item forecast and a service level expectation really enhances that aging conversation, as you said. Right, yeah. because it goes and it looks at a probabilistic forecast that we've arrived at and paints a picture as to where a particular item is right now along that. Is it, it are we starting to be in trouble with this? If we're yeah. saying four days or less and we're at three days and it's not through the first stage of our workflow, we should probably really have a hard conversation about it. Yeah. And this is this this again goes into the how, right? We say that at a at a minimum, you need a starting point and an ending point. But the better defined your process is, right? The more stages you've you've identified, whether those are just work stages or queuing stages, and we talk about these things not, not in this course, but in other courses, right? But the more insight you'll actually get in, in, in how are these things acting? How are they be behaving? Where are my potential problems? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put that here. The better the workflow, the better the conversation. How's that, Will? Oh, yeah. I have another why. Continuous improvement. So um, for those of you people out there that are using Scrum, uh, one of the things that you could do with this is you could use a cycle time scatter plot. Um, and actually, this is not just Scrum. I should let me retract that sentence. A cycle time scatter plot would allow you to go and bring into a continuous improvement conversation and look at it and say, how are we doing? Are we, are, is, how's our process? Is our process becoming more predictable? What happened to this outlier? Look at these that are going down this. Are we trending this way? Are, are things all over the place? 
So it really enables a data-driven conversation in continuous improvement type events. So I'll add that. I'm going to say enables a uh, rich conversation during continuous improvement events. And something like a retrospective is where I'm thinking here, but that let's not chain ourselves to that, right? Any kind of continuous improvement event that we want to have, bringing a cycle time scatter plot in there and looking at what we've done, uh, even probably when the more recent uh, realm of, of time uh, uh, it really enables these better conversations. And the wonderful thing is, right, we've been talking here a lot about kind of the smaller items of work, right? Feature delivery, uh, service delivery, dealing with uh, dealing with customer uh, customer complaints or requests, those sorts of things. But really, you can use cycle time at every level, right? So, so one example that I found quite powerful in in organizations, even if they're not doing anything related to Scrum and Kanban, but just sit with their PMO and look at their project delivery over the past few years. Look at the cycle time of those projects, right? When were they when were they instantiated? When was the business case approved? And when were they actually closed? Right. And that in turn allows you to start doing some of that statistical analysis on those things, right? If we're if we're going through a new budgeting round this year and we've identified 20 projects that we want to deliver in this year, but you know historically through cycle time analysis, through that probabilistic forecasting that you most likely only deliver about seven or eight, right? You can you can cut off a lot of pressure on your employees right at the start by saying, hey, you know, this uh your ambitions do not match up to the probabilities I'm seeing here. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, think of the conversations that that has, right? And then we start to talk about um we start to talk about how how much impact uh limiting work and in progress has, right? Like it's just such richer conversations when we're measuring this. And by the way, you already have this data very likely. Oh, yeah. This is in um, uh, every system on the planet measures a start and end point, right? It's just looking and understanding what endpoint your system is uh, is uh, defaulting to and making sure that's in line with what you want. So yeah. um, your quality might not be great, mm -hmm. but our guarantee here is that you have enough data to get started. Yeah. Um, you know, one last why here, and uh, we're going to have a subsequent video on this. Uh, why? Because there's another metric called throughput. And in order to do, uh, in order to do multi-item forecasting, meaning here's a list of things and we have to answer when will they be done? Uh, how do we do that? Uh, we do that by measuring throughput and then having a probabilistic forecast using Monte Carlo on that. So I'm just going to put enabler of other things right and really if i were to say where you start uh you probably would you would probably start with your starting and ending points and defining cycle time i think if you have that button down work item age is an easier conversation because you know where you are you know where your starting point is and your ending point is and you know where it's aging towards that ending point um and uh and yeah now i'm just mumbling well <laughs> you got any more wire house or should we go into some examples I, I think uh, I think we've hit our stride here. Um, I think we're we're good to go on examples. Yeah, um, you know a really basic example, and I can't get it out of my head, right? And by the way, once you start thinking about this stuff, it never gets out of your head, because will every time I get in line at airport security, I can't help but think uh, their starting point is me getting in line, and their ending point is me getting through and having my shoes on. Now I'm I have TSA pre-check, so I'm a little bit of an expedite, right? We'll, we won't talk mm -hmm. about the impact that that has on everybody else, but an example would be the starting point of security and the ending point of you getting through. The airport has that defined, and they measure it, right? So, so airport security, uh, and I think about this all the time. I'm just wondering, like, hmm, wonder what my cycle time is going to be today getting through airport security. Oh yeah. Pretty basic example, but it's that simple, right? It cannot be unseen once you've uh, once you find it. It's actually it can actually drive you drive you mad, right? <laughs> it can. No, I've um, uh, I know the the same thing. I'm currently suffering from uh, from this. So uh, as an as an example as well is um, you know tax season is coming up again. Mm -hmm. 
And every year, the uh, the re- um, the tax office of the Netherlands gets a lot of filings that they have to go and check. And hopefully, there's no there's no anomalies, and they can uh, they can close things up pretty quickly. Um, but occasionally, they have other questions, or people have made some mistakes, or you know, there's there's some uncertainties within the laws. And so these things can extend and extend and extend. I'm actually mm-hmm. still waiting mm-hmm. for my for my official tax filing from 2021 to be approved. Okay, we're gonna put tax season exclamation mark right. frowny face. So here we also see this 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 interesting relationship with work in progress, right? Where tax season starts and suddenly you have even in a small country like the Netherlands, I can't even imagine what it's like in the U.S. You have millions of people all throwing work into a system all at the same time. And that's when the workflow starts, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it's and it's done when the taxes are paid. <laughs> right? oh, no, and they have no problem collecting company. those taxes, do they, Will? Oh, yeah. Can I add a, um, I'm sorry to, to, if, if you had another example, because um, I wanted to add a warning area here um, just so, so we can get to it, because I think there's some warnings that come with this. Um, and, and you know, from your tax example uh, that you were mentioning before, I think it's important to point out when it comes to time to market and looking at time to market from an evidence based management perspective. I'm going to reiterate that these starting and ending points are very important for you to make well under well understood and 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 really know yourself because the wild ramifications of ending point meaning taxes paid and ending point meaning taxes filed those are two very different things. Taxes filed is one thing, but there's a whole bunch of things that could happen as far as discrepancies until you finally have the check mark that says taxes paid. You might end up having to owe uh, you might uh, ha- have some kind of discrepancy that you're interacting with. You don't know. So it's vitally important from us from an evidence-based management, if we were going to look at things like cycle time, that we know our starting and ending points. So I'm going to put that as a warning. Uh, make sure you are clear what where this ends more than anything, where this ends. I think that's a, I think that's a pretty important thing to call out. Are you with me, Will? Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. And it, and it goes on to a theme that we mentioned in the work item age episode where you say, well, you know, the definition of when things start, isn't always up to you. Um, likewise, the definition of when it ends also isn't always up to you, mm-hmm. right. As an organization, as a team within that organization, um, you have to be very explicit about this. Right. When is your work done? When is the organization's work done? When is the work done from the customer perspective? Right. These are different things. And if you don't have that conversation early on, and that sounds very pedantic, um, it can cause big problems later on. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important when we're viewing this through the lens of evidence based management. Well, really in general. Um, you know, an- another one I'm going to put on here, Will, this is, and I'm putting it in all capitals. You ready for this? This is not a performance measurement. This is not something that we go and we say the cycle time of the team is decreasing. The team's doing better, right? Because what you're going to do is you're going to call cause adverse behaviors. If you're trying to get your team to decrease your cycle time, this is what it is. And the moment that you put it in place as a sake of performance, it loses all, um, all ability to tell you anything. I think honestly, this is a this is a a warning for all of EBM. This is yep. not intended as a performance measurement system. And the moment that you start using it as such, or even when it's perceived as such, when 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 any of these metrics are associated with the value of people, um, they cease working. Yeah, like flat out. It's that binary. They will stop working the moment they become associated with people value. Yeah, and and uh, and and this will just it would it, as you're saying it would not tell you anything. Then you're measuring for the sake of measuring, and on top of that, you have very likely impacted morale. Right? right. People will know that you're measuring something, and they will game to it not because they're bad, but because, but probably fear. Right. 
And so let's not use this as a performance measurement. It, it is not intended for that. So I wanted to, that's, I hope you like my riff on this warning area, Will, because I think it's yeah. pretty important. I like it. I like it. That said, Todd, looking at our own work item age for this episode, <laughs> 20 I, think, uh, I think we should be turning this into cycle time. I think so too. Uh, all right, Will. So this does it for another episode of uh, evidence-based management, specifically around time to market. Again, if you have not, please like and subscribe. That's what keeps us going on these videos. Uh, as always, contact Will or I on any social medias. Well, really LinkedIn, because that's all we have. <laughs> so uh, until next time, uh, I think next time we'll be looking at throughput. See you then. That's the plan. See you next time.